Good morning. I am Jung Ja Oh. It's a pleasure to join in this training session on ICH guideline. It was a good opportunity for me to uh, review what I have uh, learned, and it, I am happy to share what I know with you. Today, I will be talking about the overview of the guideline, and I'll talk about you know, toxicity test. And thirdly, how to interpret the test results and how to uh, go about with follow-up tests. For this guideline, The purpose is to optimize the standard genetic toxicology battery and to provide standard for interpretation of the test results, results so that uh, we could improve risk characterization for carcinogenic effect. Currently, this uh, guideline is uh, about test of new small molecules, drug substances for human. Genotoxicity uh, test is uh, designed to detect any potential uh, genotoxic sub substances. The purpose of this guideline is actually about how to pre interpret test results. So that was the background for the revision of the guideline. Before I get into more details about the guideline, let me briefly talk about the genotoxicity test. Here it says test battery, um, and it talks about the most common uh, types of tests for genotoxicity. Before I talk about this test, when you register drug products, comprehensive evaluation of the genotoxicity is required. And when you uh, prepare for a battery test, AIMS test using bacteria, when there is a positive result, the mutagenicity that means uh, the result can be interpreted as uh, uh, a potential toxicity. And by adding in vitro test, carcinogenic substance detection uh, can be done at a higher sensitivity and lower specificity. Due to these characteristics, the positive result, irrelevant of human use, can be also found. With a standard battery test, with a single uh, test, uh, there is no single test that can uh, cover all of the genotoxicity. That is why the standard battery test is important and required. In standard battery test, we talk about mutagenicity and genotoxicity, two different types. Mutagenicity uh, is usually a talk about the genetic changes and the majority of genotoxic rodent and human carcinogen. And genotoxicity is uh, for in vitro and in vivo, in mem mammalian. This guideline includes option one and option two. In option one, in in vitro, AIMS test belongs to this category. And then in vitro chromosome damage 
to check the damage in vitro chromosome operation assay, micronucleus assay, and mouse lymphoma TK gene mutation assay. Under in vivo genotoxicity, there is a, a test for chromosome damage in vivo NM and in vivo CA. For option two, there is no in vitro cell test. For mutagenicity, bacteria reverse mutation assay, and for in vivo, it is based on micronucleus assay, and as a second um, assay, comet assay uh, or DNA covalent bonding assay can be used. Genotoxicity test can be explained in this way. Gene mutation is checked using bacteria. AIMS test is the most known test for bacterial reverse mutation assay and for in vitro MLA and for in vivo TGR mutation and peak A assay. And second is to check the clastogenicity that shows structural abnormality abnormally. In vitro includes CA or MN and for in vivo CA or MN and MHTT uh, is another possible option under clastogenicity. MHTT and RDLA. And to check the uh, uh, abnormalities in uh, numbers, there is in vitro MN and in vivo MN. To check DNA damage, uh, there is UDS or COMET assay. So the takeaway uh, message here is that if you take a look at the uh, components in option one and two, mutagenicity and chromosome damage and mutagenicity are the main areas to be checked. From now on, let me talk about the test methods in this test. Um, how to do the test is based upon OECD guideline. ICH and OECD guideline differences come from the different components. ICH is for small molecule and human use. So there is a difference in concentration. Other than that, the difference is not very big. So I'll explain based upon OECD guideline. For bacterial reverse mutation assay, I think you are most familiar with this test. test. Using five uh, bacteria, the test is done. And for the test uh, compound, there is a mixing and uh, number is compared. So when there is a bacterial reverse mutation compared to negative control, there will be an increase in number. So the increase will uh, tell you um, the results. So uh, we follow the guideline. TA100 or other types uh, could be selected as test strains. The evaluation of results. To, we see whether there's a concentration related increase or reproducible increase. So in this case, the result is positive. In current bacterial reverse mutation assay, statistical analysis is not applied. Next, in vitro chromosome operation assay. After uh, cell culture, collagen is given. And then the intermediate cell is collected and the sample is prepared. To your right, you see the, you see the um, DNA uh, chromosome. And this test is to check structural differences in details. The test uh, strains 
For test trains, uh, you, you, we use cell line or prior culture. According to the OECD guideline, the way to evaluate the results is to see a statistically significant increase. For example, when there is a chromosome change, and if that could be understood as uh, statistically significant, and whether the increase is those related, and whether the results are outside of the distribution of the historical historical negative control data. Next, in vitro micronucleus assay. The cell used is what you see from the screen. This is commonly used for genotoxicity test. And the way it's done is similar to in vitro chromosome. So Cytokine B is used, so um, the cell is not divided, and that is how we prepare the sample. And with this tying, there are two nucleus and small uh, parts of DNA, and the number of this nucleus, if there is a statistically significant increase of the number of the nucleus, and if the uh, increase is those related, and if it's outside the distribution of the historical negative control data, they are positive. With the revision of the guidance, the statistical significance, those re uh, relatedness, and uh, distribution of the historical negative control data outside of that range, these three become the standard for most of the result evaluation. Um, ICH does not clearly talk about the uh, criteria or the standard for the evaluation of the results. That's why I am quoting the uh, standard from OECD. For uh, DNA and nucleus assay, when we decide follow-up uh, test, these are the things to be considered. The uh, benefit of the uh, chromosome test is that we will be able to see the details of the difference or problem with the uh, uh, chromosome. But during the evaluation uh, period, we need a skilled analyst. For in vitro MNSA with a uh, fluorescent tying, when we do the chromosome test, there could be a damage or there could be a uh, damage that does not actually um, impact on the nucleus itself. In this CBMN, we can check the actual damage on the DNA in chromosome, and that is the benefit of having this test. Next, mouse lymphoma gene mutation assay. We use these cells for the test. After a cell culture, pyrimidine or purine um, is given. Then normal cells DNA structure will change. So for normal cells, there will be no formation of colonies. But for mutated cells, colony will be uh, formed. As you can see from the picture um, at the bottom left, after 90 days of uh, incubation, There's a large colony and small colony, and we can check the gene uh, mutation. For large colony, that's, that indicates mutation. Small colony uh, is about a chromosome mutation. So with a single test, the mutagenicity and other uh, damages can be found. 
in this essay, unlike in an vitro essay in the previous slide, GEF, the global evaluation factor, is used for the evaluation of the result. So far, we talked about in vitro essay, and starting from now, we'll be talking about in vivo essays. In a genotoxicity battery test, the most um, common tests include a nucleus assay, which is in vivo. And this is to check gen mutation and um, gene changes. And the most common in vivo nucleus assay for gene uh, mutation is to give the test compound to rodent. And from bone marrow, we check the, um, the premature um, cell level. So during the process, after the after the um, cell gets divided, the DNA uh, parts cannot uh, go out of the cell. It, it remains inside. So. In this essay, the test compound is given. The uh, sample is create. A sample is generated in bone marrow, and the remaining nucleus is checked. As you can see from the uh, picture, uh, at the top there is a um, dyeing using purple dyeing, and the below is the fluorescent dyeing. So, visually, uh, you can visually check the results. CD seventy two. Uh, can be attached, and the fax testing is also possible. Next, in vivo chromosomal damage assay. In vivo chromosomal uh, damage assay, the test compound is given. And I talked about the usage of collagen previously. The same method is used using collagen. And then we use microscope for in vitro and in vivo chromosome damage assay. The way we check and interpret the results are almost the same. Next, in vivo comet assay. For in vivo comet assay, it was introduced from the guideline from 2016. Rodent is used, and this is used for liver only. For stomach and blood, a uh, comet assay can be applied. So the component is given to rodent. Liver is extracted single cell from the liver um, is generated. And we uh, put it on the sli slide. And using the electronic device, we see the reaction. And using Comet SA program, we check the results. And there is a and in the final dying step, the normal cell without DNA damage, as you can see from the picture, dying is done very neatly. But the cell with DNA damage, there are tails. Uh, so with electronic device, 
the DNA with minus charge will move to plus charge. That's why there is a tailing effect, and the DNA's strength in the tail is used for the evaluation of the result. Next, in vivo pig A assay. This is still in draft stage. Um, there is no official guideline yet. Mammals are used. Pig A gene impacts GPI expression on the cell. Compound is given. And we see whether this gene is expressed or not. It says uh, evaluation is done using facts. Lastly, in vivo transgenic rodent essay. Our organization is not doing this yet, and there are three test types available according to the guideline. So far, I talked about in vitro and in vivo nine essays. And as for the follow-up test, um, there are enough number of um, tests that I already explained that can be linked to follow-up test. So in the S2R1 guideline, I shared what option one and option two are, and I represented in the diagram here, and the follow-up testing or the past batteries were well shared. So if we opt for the option number one, then we will do the in vitro cell testing. And if the result is negative, then we will move to the uh, micronucleus assay. And in option two, we do not go for the in vitro. Rather, we go for a micronucleus assay. And the second end point can be obtained with other in vivo assay. In option one, if the in vitro assay produce positive results, and then option two can be a good strategy as a follow-up. So before we had S2R1, there was no mentioning of option two, so two in vitro and one in vivo uh, were comprising the battery. But depending on the analyte, uh, we can choose uh, any of them. And as I said before, for in vitro, if the result is positive and in, in vivo, the assessment on two tissues produce negative result, and there is no uh, ground to confirm that there is a genotoxicity. For option one and option two, micronucleosis assay can be done in combination with a single dose or a repeat dose toxicity testing. Particularly for option two, if the in vitro is done with the, uh, the repeat dose, then the sampling can be done all together. So there are some advantages. What I'm saying is that it's a possible or viable way to do it. And whether it is option one or two, if the result is negative from the battery, then 
we can conclude that there is no sufficient evidence for genotoxicity potential, and therefore there is no requirement for further study. As I, I before we decide the follow-up test strategy, we need to decide whether we go for option one or option two, and depending on the result, we need to decide the follow-up test, what to do. So first of all, in order to do so, first of all, in option one or two, we use the bacteria for reverse mutation test. So we need to decide how we can uh, analyze that. And here the guideline says that we need to go for option one for bacteria in reverse mutation test. If the cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxicity is too strong or high, then it's not easy to get the result. So by having the in vitro, then at a low level, we can uh, observe the mutagenicity so in vitro and in vivo, they can be uh, integrated into one. And secondly, if there is a compound that has the structurally uh, structure alert, and of course we can utilize Q star assay in order to see if there is any alerting structure, and of course it is related to the pharmaceutical impurities. The compounds that have structural alerting alert and it has the positive result in AIMS test, then uh, there are they have carcinogenicity, so we have to take it into consideration. And sometimes, rather than AMIS, some compounds are can be detected better in the micro uh, the chromosomal aberration assay. There are some limitations in in vivo testing. The targets like bone marrow, uh, blood, or liver, but the ICH guideline has been like 10 years old. So there have been a lot of uh, testing or the assessment made on other target organs. And when we conduct the in vivo testing, these compounds need to be well or sufficiently exposed within the body and therefore arrived at this target organs. But if the compounds is not observed systematically or the systemic absorption is not there and if they do not arrive at the target organ, the negative result would not have any impact. And sometimes the local responses can be generated by compounds, and if that, the analyte are such a compound, it's really difficult to confirm whether that compound is arrived uh, in the bone marrow or not. If that is the case, then we need to adjust the route of administration so that the compounds can arrive at the bone marrow, but it, this may not be always possible. So the guideline says in vitro uh, assay may be sufficient. And for your reference, in OECD guideline for in vivo testing, the system, uh, systemic absorption or systemic exposure should be obtained. And in order to confirm that, within the testing uh, method, uh, there is no uh, way to confirm that. And therefore, the same species or the same route of administration need to be confirmed with the ADMA data or PK data as a separate study. And for the somatic cell, if there is no to genotoxicity, then it will not affect uh, germ cells.
in vivo as an in vitro uh, in vivo testing to confirm the chromosome damage as i said in vivo chromosomal aberration assay and in vivo micronucleus assay The in vitro testing result and uh, mechanism will dictate what kind of the in vivo study should be taken or conducted. However, when we extrapolate that into the in vivo testing is that we need to consider the endogenous genes and the potential of the gene mutation or the chromosomal aberration in those endogenous genes. So genotoxicity testing method, the general way, we cannot confirm that. And therefore, as an alternative, in vivo testing has been considered. But what is important here is the chromosomal uh, damage. So as I said, when I shared about the options, the comet assay or transgenic animal model can be utilized and let's say we are doing the in vivo testing but the half-life is too short therefore the metabolite will just go away shortly then option two is recommended And depending on the compound, it may be toxic for blood or bone marrow. And if, the, if that is the case, and if it's used for the repeat dose testing, it can cause an issue because it, is, uh, ex it, ex it makes an expose, exposure for a long time. So it's not easy to confirm and check the micronucleus in bone marrow or blood. So. The blood sampling need to be done early in the phase so that we can uh, see the micronucleus in uh, bone marrow. Otherwise, we will go for the in vitro or in vivo micronucleus assay, but we do not repeat it just one time and then do the sample. And next is the considerations to be made when we have the negative in vivo test result. I said that if we, when we conduct the in vivo testing, it is important to have the systemic exposure and the target organs need to be exposed. Let's say now we have negative result. When uh, then we have to confirm whether the result is negative uh, when the targets, uh, target organs are exposed to the testing compounds or not. An in vivo micronucleus assay, there are some standards where we can say that the target organs are exposed. One way would be the cytotoxicity. We can uh, see the proportion of immature erythrocytes among total erythrocytes in a normal way. It should be one to one ratio. However, if the proportion of the immature erythrocytes has been reduced, then it means that the target organ is sufficiently exposed. Then if there is a toxicity in liver or in other organs, that can be checked too. So it can be pro providing a additional information by histopathological evaluation or blood biochemistry indicators. In bone marrow, 
micronucleus assay, we look at the toxicity in bone marrow. So if the testing compound is detected in blood or plasma, then we can see, we can believe that it already arrived bone marrow and for liver, the liver is expected to be exposed for the compound with systemic exposure so it can be used as a target organ. And if not, in other cases, we need to measure the amount of the uh, testing compounds in the target organs, but it's not easy. And depending on the in vitro testing result, as I said before, at the end of the day, it is really important to confirm whether the compound uh, arrived at the target organs and system, uh, systematically, uh, systemically absorbed in the body. The genotoxicity study is not to detect non-genotoxic carcinogens. And for the standard battery, depending on the testing condition, we may have false negative results. So we need to design the battery quite, uh, well so that we do not have false negative results. But still, because of the non-genotoxic reasons, there can be some uh, positive result coming out. So we should be very careful about that. So this guideline says that even if we do have the positive result for the genotoxicity, that does not always mean that it can cause, uh, car it can be a carcinogenic materials within the body or the genotoxic potentials. And we need to think about biological relevance. And the genotoxicity potential is not existing if, first of all, all the indicators show a little bit of increase, but there is no relation with the uh, dosage or if it does not show a strong correlation with the historic data and or uh, if the responses that are not reproducible or weak and that would be not considered biologically meaningful. For in vitro and in vivo testing, when we do have the positive result and before we decide the follow-up test strategies, there are some things to be considered. First of all, for the bacterial mutation assay produce positive result, that means that there can be a, a huge potential for the DNA reactivity. And the, the, the colony may increase because of the pre-amino acid. So that should be checked. And secondly, a certain enzymes present in bacteria so that may be uh, interacting. So that should be checked too. And secondly, an in vitro cell assay, if the positive result is out from that assay, then we need to check whether it, such a result is coming from in vivo, like uh, osmosis or pH or deposition of cells. Those things need to be uh, checked. And at the highest level or the concentration, the positive result is out only at the highest uh, level or the concentration. If that is the case, then the genotoxicity potential is low, so we can choose option one. So uh, in vivo uh, would be sufficient here. And for 
the case where we have the in vitro negative result, for example, panacetin, in reverse mutation assay, the commercially available uh, metabolite is red, so the testing can be conducted on that. And there is a negative result from the reverse mutation assay, but when we utilize hamster meta metabolite, metabolite, the reverse mutation assay produce positive result, and therefore, depending on the compound, we may have to use different uh, the meta uh, metabolite. And next is what we need to consider. We do the in vivo. We need to consider three things. In micronuclear say there is an increase. However, it may not be related to the compound. So it may be because of the poietic responses or temperature the body temperature, so we need to check that. And the DNA adult related data when it is used, the endogenous adult as a background need to be assessed too. And when we look at the DNA aberration or damage during the testing, Unnecessary DNA damage that is not related to the testing may impact the results, so we need to uh, check that too. Whether it is in vitro or in vivo, when we test the genotoxicity, we need to confirm whether such a change in toxicity is related to the uh, genomic matters. And if it is not, then it is not relevant to the uh, clinical conditions or the clinical trials. So when we have the in vitro and in vivo test result, and we consider the relevant points, and then we need to decide which follow-up test need to be done. In opt option one or option two, maybe the follow-up testing strategies are already uh, quite shaped in in vitro testing. We have the positive result. If that is the case, then we do in vivo testing as a follow-up. Then here we can change the genotoxicity indicators or we can do two in vivo testings. And if the in vitro testing, the positive result is out only when uh, the metabolite activities were adjusted, then the follow-up test need to utilize li uh, liver. In vivo micronucleus assay produce positive result, and that if that is the case, and we need to think about whether there is an impact on erythropoiesis, and the, whether there is an impact from hypo or hyperthermia. So we need to consider that. And if the positive result in the in vivo micronucleus assay, we need to consider whether it is because of the chromosome loss or the chromosome breakage. So it means that we need to think about whether it is a uh, the damage in number or a structure. And as for the carcinogenicity or the genocide, uh, genotoxicity, which is related to the carcinogenic potential. What the guideline says is that we did uh, the older testing, and now we have the negative result from the genotoxicity testing uh, battery. And 
it is quite sure now that we do have the carcinogenicity, but we cannot clearly explain it. And at the end of the day, we believe that that is from the genotoxicity. It has the genotoxicity, but the genotoxicity testing uh, produce no positive result. So here, what we can do is that we can modify the com uh, conditions for metabolic activation in in vitro, or we can check the DNA damage. Or we can assess the gene which is related to tumor. And for the DNA damage, the tissue with a tumor can be assessed in order to see if there is any changes or uh, modifications in gene. So I talked about the guideline. And because this guideline deals with the small molecules, I also talked about the follow-up strategies. So from now on, I will talk about other guidelines and what they say about follow-up strategies. The first one is the EMEA guideline. There is a step one, two, three, and four. So AIMS test is conducted first. And if the test result is positive or negative, then depending on the test result, you can follow this tree decision making, uh, the decision making tree. So in vitro comes first, and in vivo is used as a follow up. And this is quite a uh, similar approach or the same approach to other guidelines too. And second guideline is from EFSA. There are endpoints including gene mutation and chromosomal damages. So step one would be in vitro. So basic battery testing is done involving in vitro micronucleus assay and bacteria reverse mutation assay. And if it is negative result, then there is no need for the follow-up. And if it's positive, then uh, the in vivo testing follows. So if the test result is positive, so we are going for the second step. For gene mutation, we can do the COMET assay or gene mutation assay. For the chromosomal aberration, we can do the micronucleus testing. And depending on the scenario, as you can see from the slide, uh, from the slide, AMS test positive, in vitro micronucleus negative, comet assay or mutation assay, or comet assay plus in vivo a micronucleus assay can be done. And second scenario is that AIMS test negative, in vitro micronucleus positive. If that is the case. For in vitro, the structure and the uh, number uh, can be checked with the fluorescent, and therefore it's easier to decide the follow-up strategy. So if there is a structure def uh, damages, but there is no relation to the metabolite activation, then we can go for in vivo MN. And if there is a uh, cholestogenic effect, then in vivo plus comet assay. For scenario three, both tests produce positive result. And if that is the case, in vivo MN plus comet assay or in vivo MN uh, plus transgenic mutation assay. So what is clear here is that we can use the comet test or the comet assay and in vivo model together as a combination. And this is from EU. The follow-up testing strategy is well described for different types of the compound. Usually, uh, in vitro comes first, and the in vivo follows. That's the basic structure. And next one is the nanomaterial genotoxicity roadmap. 
This is from a published literature. This publication does not recommend reverse mutation assay, MLA, as an in vitro. Uh, this is recommended as a first step, and then in vivo is recommended as the follow up. And lastly, the guideline deals with the pharmaceuticals. So therefore, impurities assessment is also important. From the MFDS of Korea, there are many different documents on the genotoxic impurities. So with that, I'd like to close my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the center lead, Jung Ja Oh's presentation was given. Thank you for your time. Now we will take questions. Those who are present uh, here, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Those participating virtually, please post your question on open Q&A um, chat box. Or uh, we could start with uh, pre-submitted questions. I think people are shy to ask the very first question. If you have any questions, I'm just going to ask one more time. Um, no questions? Then I will relay the pre-submitted question. For gene therapy like CAR-T, for gen uh, general toxicity test, uh, if the standard is applied for CAR-T, then it would be difficult to carry out the test. So in this case, what kind of tests and assays are recommended? I'm afraid it's difficult to uh, answer to that question right away. Uh, if you could send me an email with uh, more details with the question, I'll be more than happy to respond. So that was a pre-submitted question. Since this topic is not a easy one, I think um, Ms. O uh, will provide a full answer by email. Once again, thank you very much. Um, now we will take a quick break.